Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa The Tilakana, the three characteristics of all conditioned phenomena are not just a theoretical uh, construct. They're not just uh, a metaphysical framework. They, they really have a profound effect on your, your being and your, uh, uh, your mind and, and your life when you begin to understand them and you begin to internalize them and take them to heart rather than just hold them as abstract ideas. <clears throat> Which is often how we approach the um, three characteristics. As a theoretical framework and construct, they're powerful enough, but when you really internalize them and start to uh, live with those as the basis of your of your uh, your being, then it really changes things. <clears throat> the three characteristics, of course, are dukkha and nicca anatta. Uh, dukkha, sometimes translated as suffering, although that's an inadequate translation, and, and nicca permanence and anatta, uh, not self, or more broadly emptiness or voidness. The dukkha really means something like imperfection. It's the provisional or imperfect or incomplete nature of all conditioned phenomena, that is everything that we experience with the, the senses and everything that passes through our minds until we realize Nibbana. Dukkha is also the first noble truth, the truth of suffering. In that, in that context, the translation of suffering works reasonably well. And because of, of this, sometimes people who have a very uh, superficial acquaintance or understanding of Buddhist teachings, they think that Buddhism is a gloomy or pessimistic kind of philosophy, to say, to uh, emphasize suffering. But it's not intended that way. I would say it's more realist a realist uh, philosophy that you're uh, when you take that on board and have that understanding of, of the universality of dukkha it's like taking off the, the rose colored glasses you, you're seeing things clearly and you don't expect anything to be perfect or anything to fully satisfy the mind. So, understanding or appreciating dukkha means letting go of illusions and uh, false um, uh, false ideas about. Uh, things being perfect. Now, a lot of people, I think, in the world, they get caught up in um, trying to make themselves happy by experiences or acquisitions. You know, if, if only I get this job, or if only I get this relationship, or if only I make more money, then I'll be happy. You know, and maybe they get those things and maybe they don't they don't, then they suffer from not having what they desire. But if they get it, they will 
experienced some temporary satisfaction and happiness, but it fades and then they find themselves desiring the next thing. There's no possible way of satisfying the desire mind with the objects of the senses, with the objects of samsara. Which is not to say that everything, everything is horrible and, and uh, painful, because obviously it's not. There are pleasant uh, experiences and uh, beautiful things in the world, and we can open our, our, uh, our mind and our hearts to the enjoyment of those if we don't expect them to be perfect, and we don't expect them to fulfill all our deepest needs. Then we can take things on their face value as they are for, for what what good they have in them and enjoy that wholeheartedly without an expectation that it's going to be the end of uh, end of all your your longings. It's just a pleasant experience that's all it is. If we understand dukkha, we can also deal with the unpleasant experiences more easily because we give up on the idea that they, they shouldn't happen. You know, one of the ways people suffer in the world is when something uh, unpleasant or bad or painful happens, they, they think, why me? You know, this is so horrible, what did I do? But this, that's just the nature of, of existence. You are going to have pleasant experiences and you're going to have painful experiences until you make an end of samsara. The that's the meaning of samsara, it's going around in circles. And you're going to be constantly having experiences of all kinds. It's been uh, noted by, you know, it's sort of a stereotype almost that uh, people that live in um, Southeast Asia, Theravada Buddhist countries, tend to be very cheerful, and happy people. And this is, you know, many people have noted that. There's sort of a stereotype of the Thai smile. You know, the, um, and it, it's, it's really true you know, that when you... When you understand and internalize uh, the teaching of dukkha, it, it doesn't make you gloomy and pessimistic. It actually makes you more buoyant and resilient. It's good to uh, remember that um, this is samsara. It's always going to be broken. It's, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't ever make things perfect. If you if you uh, are striving for perfection, then you're always going to be disappointed. <clears throat> and if you're seeking the perfect situation, or the perfect uh, the perfect job, or the perfect anything, you know, it's not there. It doesn't exist. So dukkha is really, it's the, the brokenness, the roughness, the imperfection of samsaric phenomena. And it's inevitable, it, it has to be that way, because by coming into manifestation, by existing, it's already inherently imperfect. The only approach to perfection is the, the void, the emptiness, where nothing is manifest, then everything is possible. It's a universal potential. You think of, uh, you know, the, the void, is, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, they sometimes call emptiness the full emptiness. And they, they, can, um, they use the imagery of a womb. The so womb is an empty space, but has the potential of uh, creating new life. And the um, the void is like that in that 
nothing is manifest, therefore everything is possible. <clears throat> but once you have actual phenomena, actual things existing, once they come into manifestation, <clears throat> they've, they've lost that potential. They're only a fragment of the universal potential. So they're never going to be perfect. And they're never going to be fully satisfying. And the great uh, <clears throat> trap, the great uh, addiction of the mind, the primordial addiction of the mind is chasing after objects, consciousness seeking an object with the desire to complete itself or, or to find a, a, a perfection, uh, a perfect resting place. And that will not be found in the objects. But the mind continually, moment by moment, <clears throat> grasping for the next shiny thing. The next object is taken and then it's it's not satisfying so the mind goes on to the next one. And Nietzsche, impermanence, tells us that nothing persists. <coughs> and at the, the deepest level as spoken about in Abhidhamma, the actual existing Existent phenomena only occur for a single moment in an unbroken stream. But at the, at the coarser level of our actual experience, everything we have and, and hold, everything we touch and experience is transient. It's not going to last. This is another way being suffer is because they... Um, they expect things are going to last and persist. You know, and then they feel suffering and pain when they of loss when they don't persist. <clears throat> but if you understand at a deep intuitive level that nothing is permanent, then you can enjoy the good experiences when, while they happen because you're not expecting them to be either perfect, the stuka, or you're not expecting them to be everlasting. This at this moment is a pleasant experience, and next moment it's gone. And it, it really is one of the ways people spoil their own good experiences is by anticipating their loss. And bad or painful experiences are also impermanent. You can take some comfort in that, that this too shall pass, that nothing is either for good or, or for bad, nothing is, is permanent. Everything is constantly in a state of change. And the way to, uh, to live harmoniously and happily is not to struggle and fight against the reality of, of change, but to learn how to navigate in the stream. Not to try and fight the current, but to learn to navigate in the stream. Often people uh, are upset and fear change just because it's something different. They don't uh, appreciate the reality that things are constantly ever-changing. Nothing at all persists. And at the deepest level, nothing is the same from moment to moment. To understand that and accept it on a deep level, this is the reality. Then you can pass through uh, pass through life much easier, much happier. And some Asian cultures that are heavily influenced by Buddhism have some greater understanding of this. Like in Japan, one of the big events 
happens every year is the cherry blossoms coming out. And people go to where the cherry blossoms grow to see the cherry blossoms. Um, I remember, and they only last for a very, very brief time, two or three days, and they all fall down. And <clears throat> I remember reading once about some one of these cherry blossom viewing parties, and there was a an American who wanted to, he suggested, why don't we gather up the cherry blossoms and, and put them under glass and keep them safe, you know, save them. And the Japanese just kind of laughed at him like, that's not the point. The point is, you know, the, the beauty at this moment is here present. And learn to enjoy it in the moment, not try and preserve it under glass for, for later. Also, I, I've heard of in in, uh, in China they do in northern China where they have cold winters they do ice sculptures and part of the uh, part of the, um, the artistry is if you can make a, a, a sculpture it's considered you know <clears throat> the highest form of the art if you can make a sculpture that retains some beauty of form as it's melting it changes into other you know the form morphs as it melts into other beautiful shapes. That's considered to be a very high art. You know, and that, so that's a appreciation of the change. And of course, in the end, they all, they're all just puddles of water. The third characteristic, anatta, or emptiness, is uh, quite subtle and probably harder to initially to understand or to grasp and we can approach it in, uh, in from various directions and, and um, considering it as an aspect of dependent origination or by uh, seeing how things are all composite There is no essence of chariot, but you know, these are theoretical considerations to try and gain a experiential understanding of, of emptiness and not self is perhaps more elusive. But whenever you get glimpses into emptiness and not self on a direct inner sense of it. It's extremely liberating. You know, this is really where the the magic key to unlock all the mysteries and to open all the knots. You know, one who has really grounded in not self has no fear. There, there's nothing to fear because there's nothing to lose. There's a lightness and a buoyancy, a brightness that that fills the being when it, there's no clinging to the to the uh, idea of self. It's like tearing down the boundaries, opening it, opening up to to uh, infinity. There's an old riddle about. Uh, how do you fill a sieve with seawater? You, know, you can sit on the on the beach with a sieve and keep trying to scoop up water and fill the sieve with water and you never fill it. And the answer to the riddle is you throw it in the sea. Then it's filled with filled with water, filled with seawater. When you uh, abandon the sense of self, then there's no, uh, there's nothing to to rub against. You know, the mind is, is is open and vast, and one has all the experiences that 
England had before, you know, before enlightenment, carrying wood, and, you know, carrying water, chopping wood. After enlightenment, carrying water, chopping wood. But there's all the difference in the world. Is there, if there's no sense of me, there's no uh, narrowness. There's no constriction in the mind. The mind is wide open. Abandon the, um, or you're liberated from the uh, worldly dhammas, praise and blame, loss and gain, fame and dishonor, pleasure and pain. Now these are all reference to the self, and when the self is not is not uh, identified with, there's no, no me, no mine, then none of those things matter. They're just as they are. The only reason praise or blame matter to a person is because they identify with the self. And if you're praised, you feel like yourself is being puffed up and you feel good. And if you're being blamed, Criticize, you feel like yourself is being diminished and beaten down, and you feel bad. But if you're not identifying with the self, they're, they're just empty words. Much more free. So if you take on the, the three characteristics, the dukkha, anicca, anatta, is, and make that your right, your basis of your view, this is right view, samaditi. You see the world through that lens. You'll inevitably, inevitably be happier, lighter, um, freer, uh, less anxious, less fearful. And uh, things will go better. As well, of course, being the foundation as the um, first of the uh, Eightfold Path, uh, steps on the Eightfold Path, uh, you're moving in the direction of, of ultimate ending of suffering moving in the direction of Nibbana, the more you can abandon thoughts of self, the more you can see things as imperfect and as impermanent. And wisdom inevitably dawns when you following this way. Seeing things at the opposite, imagining things to be at least possibly perfect or permanent or having substantial intrinsic reality are called the hallucinations or vipalasas. And they what bewilder beings and keep beings wandering fruitlessly, aimlessly in samsara. word vipalasa means something like bent view or crooked view, like being a, having a twisted view of reality and not seeing things in reality according to their own nature, which is yatabhuta nanadasana, knowledge and vision of things as they are, which is the road to wisdom. <clears throat> 